Welcome, everyone, uh, to the ISS. Um, on Friday, Ukraine and the EU initialed an association agreement that envisages the creation of a deep and comprehensive free trade area. The European Commission and Member States have indicated, however, that the agreement will not be signed until the October parliamentary elections and until their concerns have been put to rest about the selective use of the justice system, allegedly. Ukraine is also the subject of overtures from Russia, which aims to involve Ukraine in a customs union with Belarus and Kazakhstan. Uh, domestically within Ukraine, the elimination of the gridlock in policy making that followed soon after the February 2010 election has uh, facilitated, has made possible uh, moves of a definitive nature in, in either direction. In this context, we're very pleased today to welcome the Foreign Minister of Ukraine, Konstantin Grishenko, to the IISS. He is now in his second stint as Foreign Minister. Prior to this, he was Ukraine's ambassador to Russia and concurrently First Deputy Secretary of the National Security Coun and Defense Council of Ukraine. He has also served as a foreign policy advisor to the Prime Minister from 2006 to 2007. Uh, he was Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States from 2000 to 2003, and he was Head of Ukraine's mission to NATO. Minister, welcome. The floor is yours. Well, first uh, of all, let me simply express my appreciation and gratitude for this opportunity to talk to you in this very beautiful day in London. Somehow London is always associated with grim and uh, with a kind of uh, weather which is very unlike today's. But I see it as a very good sign, as a good sign of uh, uh, what we can expect in future. Obviously, uh, the signature, oh, the initialing of the association agreement is uh, exactly the kind of sign that, in my mind, is clearly associated with sunny weather. I don't have written notes, but let me simply uh, try to give you a more, so to say, human view of our foreign policy. Essentially, Ukraine has made its choice very clearly. It is enshrined in our legislation, and uh, that was adopted by majority of our parliament. Our main goal is uh, full integration into the European Union, and uh, the, uh, the reforms of magnitude that were initiated by President Yanukovych uh, when he, upon his election, through elections which were certified as free, fair, and fully democratic in 2010, immediately stated clear priorities for our foreign policy. One is, as I said, integration into the European Union as our final goal. It's uh, the other uh, major principle is our non-block status, a very clear also message to our neighbors and to Europe and to United States. We will pursue a foreign policy in the security area which would be based on the need to strengthen stability and security around our borders and for that we will conduct, as we do, very active efforts uh, trying to find a formula which would provide uh, security guarantees to countries both members of NATO and those who are outside of NATO and to those who have decided to follow a non-block path. We understand that in today's world we cannot be limiting ourselves only to relations and uh, uh, trade interaction and other with our neighbors only. In today's world, our interests lie both close to our borders, but also far away as well. And that is why our relations with China, with Brazil, with India, countries that have not been visited, or visitors were not coming to Ukraine for six or seven years, now are very much on the map of our priorities as well. But we still see as the major, most important 
uh, area where we should concentrate our efforts is approximating Ukraine to the standards and to approaches which are common in the EU. We live in times that are not easy on Europe. The challenges of global financial crisis and the turmoil of Eurozone have put a strain on Europe's economy and equally important on its mood. Given this kind of background and equally important uh, ground, today's Europe can be rather surprising. Whereas the rich countries within the EU are often disillusioned, the poor ones outside the Union are ready to roll up their sleeves to fulfill their dream to become a part of European family. Ukraine is one of these places. Despite the crisis in the EU, despite the lack of consensus regarding the very possibility of Ukraine's eventual membership, we place EU integration as our number one foreign policy target. Well, this year we will have uh, Euro 2012, football championship where many people will be coming visiting the country. And I would urge those who will be visiting Ukraine to talk to different set of people. More, most important, I'd like to urge you to talk to those who were born and bred after our independence, those who have no direct linkage or ties to that particular past. We don't have a generation who doesn't remember who Lenin is, who they simply don't know. And uh, that is also a sign of uh, the kind of new outlook that has very serious moral support in Ukraine society. For us, the most uh, difficult challenge is how to galvanize their optimism and make sure that they would not become disillusioned because of the lack of very clear perspective that is needed to mobilize them for the needed changes that have to be introduced in our society. We believe that more Europe might be the right remedy to EU financial malaise. But more Europe must also meet sharing responsibility for those who believe in the European idea and pin down their hopes on a better future with the European perspective for their countries. I believe that uh, just like in the 50s and 90s, this continent needs a vision. And once again, it should be a vision of unity. Not only Europe's ideological drive depends on that. This also applies for its economic perspective. Europe's division into EU and non-EU means division of the continent's economic, natural and human resources, which at a pivotal time prevents it from fully embracing its potential. Obviously, it's not the right time to make any far-reaching political promises for any aspirant country. But closing the chapter would be tantamount to drawing a new line of division in the wrong place at the wrong time. Just like decades before, when the EU was in the beginning, Europe should be able to look beyond horizon and unite. If not via bold engagement waves, then via association, free trade, and visa liberalization. Today's crisis is first and foremost a reminder to all Europeans to stay focused and to remember what the European unity is really about. In my view, it's an unprecedented experiment of bringing together the nations that for centuries were opposed or hostile to each other. This experiment should not allow it to fail, not because it's too big to fail, but most importantly, because after the two world wars and the Cold War, Europe is a totally different place. Yet in order to, to do so, it will need to step beyond yesterday's stereotypes too. And most importantly, beyond the notion that Europe's East and West, the EU and the post-Soviet space, cannot and won't come together. They can and they should. We, be, we are convinced that Europe cannot be seen complete and truly united as long as the biggest in territory nation 
located entirely in Europe, stays outside the EU. We believe that uh, our cooperation with EU in all respects and uh, the signing and ratification of the association agreement is the right path to follow. Let me stress here that the association agreement is not a gift to Ukraine. It is a very difficult negotiations that led to its completion, where the balance of interests of both EU, EU member states, and Ukraine were balanced through the both need to accept serious sacrifices on the part of Ukraine in the short term, but also an understanding of the important benefits that would flow from implementing it in the medium to long term perspective. A very important part is also visa liberalization process. We have an action plan and we are now essentially at the end of the first phase where we move from uh, adopting necessary legislation to actual creation of the um, online uh, coordination with the relevant bodies in the EU and its member states, which would facilitate movement of people across the borders. It's also clear that to get closer to Europe, we need to institute and implement serious reforms. All these reforms which were declared or initiated by the President of Ukraine are Europe compatible and bring us closer to the legislation and uh, to the procedures used in EU. How we would proceed further? We have a challenge. If our predecessors, let's take Poland, had a clear perspective and uh, were getting very substantial assistance and support in the process of uh, its integration into you, we essentially are lacking these instruments today. The support provided by EU is uh, very limited, modest, but nonetheless it's the path that we have chosen, whatever the difficulties will be there. In that respect, we can see that the country ha that has been negotiating its future with EU for dozens of years and still doesn't have a clear perspective. Turkey has made serious strides in developing, modernizing the country itself. We will find our own way, but we see the need to concentrate on practicalities, to make sure that the results of the reforms are felt by the people who would have to support our future movement in that sense. The pension reform, the uh, fight against corruption, the um, limitations placed on state bodies on all levels for their intervention where it is needed, not needed. Uh, for the businesses and for the daily life of ordinary Ukrainians are the actual results of uh, what we are doing to bring us closer to Europe. Let me also say a couple of words about security aspects of our policy. We see the need to further develop relations with Russian Federation, our largest uh, neighbor, the country that uh, is uh, very close to millions of Ukrainians through family ties, through friendships which developed over the years. It is uh, also a country which is now in the process of very deep economic and social modernization itself. We believe that uh, uh, both the European experience 
but the experience of modernization the country in other regions, including obviously our closest neighbor, Russia, is relevant to us. And uh, we would uh, uh, place all our efforts to make sure that in all areas where synergy really produces results, including obviously the resolution of the gas issue with Russian Federation, will be a major success for not only Ukraine, not only for Russia, but for overall stability and prosperity of a bigger European continent per se. It's difficult in 20 or 15 minutes to cover all the areas which are relevant to the topic of this discussion. And from that sense, I would like really to leave some time for our discussion uh, with your questions or whatever interest you will express uh, to make sure that uh, those aspects that have not been touched upon in my short presentations then will be addressed in my answers. But what I would like to stress at the end, Ukraine has clearly uh, stated its desire to be part of Europe. It has also stated its desire to be a friendly, uh, open, and supportive country to its other neighbors. It is a country that is being transformed from inside because that is the need for our own people. Our slogan is first we need to build Europe in Ukraine and then we will be able to demonstrate that Ukraine brings assets, not liabilities, to a larger Europe where we together can work to make sure that Europe's experience and its appeal continues to be the best in today's rapidly changing world. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Minister, um, for a comprehensive presentation touched on uh, Ukraine's uh, place within the European family. I noted in particular uh, your insistence that such a large nation cannot be left outside of the architecture. Uh, and thank you also for touching on some of the, the challenges facing, facing that process. I'd like to open it up now to questions. I can already see a few hands. I ask if you could first please wait till the microphone arrives, and then out of deference to the minister, please state your name and your affiliation. Uh, first Charles Grant, then James Sher, please. I'm trying to do it in the order the hands are up in. Charles Grant from the Centre for European Reform. Uh, you didn't mention, Mr. Grishenko, much about the customs union between Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Uh, the Russian leadership says they're very keen for Ukraine to join. I understand that it's not your policy to do so, but given that, as far as I'm aware, the EU has no intention of ratifying the association agreement with Ukraine at the moment, might, might you not be better off uh, looking to the customs union? And you, you, you assume that the association agreement would happen, but you didn't tell us what you can do to make the EU sign and ratify that agreement. Well, thank you. As I said, uh, it would be difficult to cover everything in 20 or so minutes, but you pointed to a very important issue here. We have uh, been discussing with uh, the three countries of the customs union the need to find a formula which would be based on what is actually happening right now. Accession of Russian Federation to the World Trade Organization and basic principles that would be lying uh, at the basis of this particular uh, union in future. From that perspective, we believe that the best solution would be to find a formula where the interest of three and Ukraine will be as fully as possible taking into account uh, because for Russian Federation, for Kazakhstan and for Belarus, in uh, many respects, access to Ukraine's infrastructure, be it ports, be it uh, 
railway system, be it many other things, as well as continuation of our industrial cooperation. Example, aviation essentially um, today is actively producing Antonov airplanes both in Russia and in Ukraine, based on the design which was developed in Ukraine. And uh, after 20 years, we still return to the idea that Antonov 70 is the best uh, air platform for long-haul transportation of both military and civilian goods. These are quite a number of examples where we see the need to uh, preserve the free access to uh, markets, Ukrainian for our partners, and uh, uh, Russian, Belarusian, Kazakhstani for us as well. And I am fully convinced that with the right attitude we will find such a formula. That is something we really believe is very important. Thank you. Uh, James Shaw. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm obliged to extend Charles Grant's question because he opened exactly the subject I wish to raise, but I will caption it by saying that it seems to be only Ukraine that is advocating such a three-way formula because there have been multiple declarations, uh, both from Moscow and Brussels, that a clear choice has to be made. So on that premise, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, there, this is still something of a puzzle because Ukraine and Russia have political systems that are converging. Their economic and business cultures are organized on uh, highly compatible principles. Uh, Russia, unlike the EU, does not erect complex and demanding conditionalities. They promise in exchange for membership of the customs union uh, free, uh, very inexpensive and predictable supplies of energy. And unlike the European Union, they clearly want you. So if a choice has to be made, uh, why does Ukraine hesitate? Well, the whole foreign policy of Ukraine, not only in the last few years, but for the last 20 years, was based on the premise that we are part of Europe and uh, the appeal of European system is uh, widely shared in Ukrainian society, especially with those who now uh, are working in many of the economic sectors, in the most progressive ones. And uh, we see also the appeal of a very huge internal market here. Uh, we understand the difficulty of entering it fully but we also understand that if you have uh, goods which are compatible with European standards, that essentially you don't have a problem trading any place, be it far away from Europe or here in itself. With uh, the customs union, this is uh, an organization which is now being uh, fine-tuned, and quite a number of issues remain there as uh, challenging as uh, they usually are when you uh, start on a path which uh, has no precedence within this particular area, regional one. Uh, our decision was made based on assumption that an understanding and conviction that Ukraine brings with itself to Europe many of the assets that are needed in modern world if in the 50s the agricultural 60s and 70s policy of EU was based on a premise of the need to limit production and to uh, subsidize, if you wish, the agriculture per se. In today's world, the number of those who would be future uh, consumers of highly added value products are growing by millions and tons of millions in India and China. We need to rethink the attitudes and then to look at the potential of Ukraine's agriculture. This is an example. Uh, we have made it very clear that we see the need for further integration, not simply of Ukraine, but also of Russia, 
and uh, other members of customs union into the European market and uh, to have more compatibility uh, in this effort with the model that is being used here. So we see the formula 3 plus 1 in our case as the most adequate for the current state of affairs, current state of relations uh, between Ukraine and the EU, between Ukraine and the countries of the customs union. We don't see this as a major contradiction because of changing, if you wish, um, picture and changing factors that are at play at current time. Thank you. Uh, Jack Straw, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you, Minister, for a very interesting talk. Uh, you referred to the issue of Ukraine's security. Um, I wonder if you could say more about its energy security, uh, particularly in the, the context uh, of the fact that it was uh, a serious challenge to Ukraine's uh, security of supplies uh, that created such difficulties in your relations with Russia. Thank you. Well, for us, uh, there are quite a number of issues related to energy security. First, it's um, uh, the need to convince both Europe as, uh, as a consumer, our destination of gas, and Russia as the producer of gas, that we are the best transport route to bring this gas from Russia and from Central Asia, hopefully, to Europe. On the one hand, it's very obvious, because it's on land, it's existing, it needs only a few billion, billions to modernize it and upgrade it. Uh, it's reliable. And the political factor which created a risk in past does not exist anymore. On the other hand, we are living uh, with the results of the 2009 gas deal that was signed under circumstances that led many to question of the motives of those who were taking decision on Ukrainian side at the time. Maybe jokingly, maybe not, but it looks as if today it's cheaper to buy gas, Russian gas from Germany than from Russia under this particular formula. This is not logical, it is not normal, it is not based on market principles or modern principles. So we believe that we need to revisit this particular formula and make it compatible with something which is relevant to European settings of the 21st century, not to the 19th century elsewhere in this relationship. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we have revisited the timelines needed for making our economy much more energy efficient. There are quite a number of things that we are doing right now. One is, unfortunately, to a certain extent, is uh, using new technologies based on coal. You know, this dispersal, whatever, system in, uh, for, for, for heating. Uh, it's uh, green energy. Today we are building one of the biggest solar power stations in Crimea, where we have so many sunny days, almost every day like that. It's wind uh, stations, power stations, but also nuclear. In winter, nuclear energy provides Ukraine with almost 50% of its uh, electricity, and we will continue to rely on this source in the future. The whole idea is to limit input of gas because it's becoming prohibitively uh, expensive. We have offered to 
go down from 52 billion cubic meters, which was signed up at that particular contract, to 28. Unfortunately, the contract was so ridiculously strange that the principle of take it or pay applies here as well. But you know, in modern world, you need to engage in contractual practice that would be, again, consonant to the principles that govern not simply intergovernmental, but simply human relations here in Europe and elsewhere. So we do uh, continue our effort with Gazprom, with uh, the government of Russia, and we hope that uh, with the new phase in the development of Russian Federation, we will be able to achieve positive results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the front, here, please. Uh, I'm Sajid Ali Khan, an ordinary member here. Actually, you've answered the question I was asking. You've answered it very well, except that uh, just as England is in, in the EU and the Congo and close ties from Canada to Australia and so on, you could be a very useful uh, complementary adjunct between Europe and uh, Asia going right down to the Pacific Ocean if there's nothing incompatible with joining the EU and the Union which has been talked about so much. Thanks. Well, I can only agree with you, so <laughs> <laughs> nothing to add, quite frankly. Okay, uh, Sarah Johnson, back, please. Hi, Minister. I'm a former Lonely Planet journalist, and I've spent many months in your country writing a few books about it. And I'm a little surprised that the names Yulia Timoshenko and Yuri Lutsenka haven't actually come up in this discussion yet. Um, you say that joining the EU is your number one foreign policy goal and yet there is resistance on the part of the EU to actually go ahead and sign the association agreement while Ukraine has what Europe considers to be political prisoners. So how do you intend to overcome this conundrum? I understand that Ms. Timoshenko has asked for the agreement to be signed, but nevertheless there is resistance on the European side. And I also think that um, to talk about there being a double standard with Ukraine because the, the Iceland Premier is also going to go to trial probably uh, doesn't cut a lot of ice with the mainstream European audience. So I was just wondering how you intend to overcome that conundrum. Thank you very much. Well, let me simply state uh, what I believe is uh, an important part of all this discussion. I have started on the premise that the association agreement is not exactly a gift to Ukraine. It is not. That is uh, an instrument to promote the values and the interest practical ones of both Ukraine, EU and its member states. It is something which is important not because it is merely a symbol or anchorage. It is uh, an instrument where, through its implementation, the reforming of different uh, aspects of uh, our economy and our social life will be intensified and will be, to a certain extent, a roadmap for that. That is why inside the country there is an overall support for the need to have this instrument ready as soon as possible. It will also take a rather substantial period of time before it's ready for signature. It is not something that we say. We are being told by the EU, by Brussels, that it takes from six months to a longer period uh, as it is the very ambitious and uh, rather lengthy document. Uh, in Ukraine, we sometimes work over time, 
sometimes much longer than the usually allocated eight hours per day. But in Europe, that is a very rare occasion and mostly on political level. So we do hope that at the time when the document will be technically ready for signature, we would have many developments, including our elections that we will be having at the end of October, which would be a major benchmark for us internally, first and foremost, but also a very serious signal to the outside world about sustainability and strength of our democracy. These are major elements of our movement toward uh, completion, signature, and later ratification of the document. And as far as uh, the um, individual cases that you have mentioned, there is in a democracy only one way to resolve it. It's through the judicial system. And we are part not only of um, it's not only through the Ukrainian judicial system, but it's also the European Court of Human Rights where we are part of and where so many Ukrainians have appealed to before. So uh, before the judicial process is over, it would be, uh, I think, uh, not right for me to get into the details as such. The fact of the matter that we are living and answering questions related to energy security, to the price of gas, and to many other aspects which resulted from the deal of 2009 is also an important factor, but not a factor which has decided the issue in the court. That is something which was investigated, looked in, and discussed there. And being part of the executive, I would have certain difficulty in being part of this country uh, government in uh, debating the judicial decisions before they are through. Thank you. Uh, Odyssey Litsevich, please. Thank you very much. It's an honor to see Minister Hrishchenko here. Um, I'm now spending some time at Chatham House in London looking into civil society in Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. And it's upsetting for me as a Ukrainian citizen to see that the transition in Ukraine is not rated highly on most of the indexes, that the democracy is falling in most of the indexes. And um, perhaps the key is in this modernization that you were mentioning. And you mentioned two countries, Turkey and, Ju and um, Russia, as a possible model for Ukraine in and seeking Poland. this and Poland, and Poland. Well. but I want to come back to uh, to uh, Turkey uh, and I think some of this transformation happened under the um, condition and a vision of this membership and the association so I think I mean, I, have, I question this as a possible model for Ukraine. But what about Russia? You spent some time being an ambassador there. You know this country well from the inside. Here also we hear questions about how realistic is this modernization in Russia. What kind of examples for you do you see in Russia that we can take over and try to, to learn by, by doing? Thank you. Well, uh, let me again stress that we uh, are... Uh, examining very carefully and seriously the different stages of reforms which have been introduced in the countries that we, uh, which are neighbors to us, first and foremost, and uh, if they had the previous experience and have a negative one, overcome it through the reform process, it is worthwhile looking into them. We are not looking for any particular specific model per se. We are looking for the reform path of Ukraine through the prism of the association agreement that we have just signed. That is essential path. If there is something which might be useful on the margins or maybe in many uh, for the certain period of time, for the next two, three, four years, then we will be also taking this into consideration. That is exactly what I tried to say. And obviously that 
uh, we will have to find our own specific approach to the situation where, as I said, we do not have, we have not been told or given a very clear perspective on the uh, full integration into EU, acceptance Ukraine when we meet all the standards. We are simply asking for very simple thing. When you are ready, when you meet all the necessary standards, you will be in. The message is not out yet, but we will persevere, we'll continue to press on the importance of this very simple and uh, very needed, again, message to us. On, on Russia, well, you know, the difference is obvious because there are a lot of money there coming from energy resources, and we are paying for these resources. So we are paying more cell, we are financing their modernization in small part, but substantial one. And that is the money which to a large extent is being detracted from our own modernization. So for us, clearly, the need to have energy efficiency in the economy and in all areas, including home ownership, you know, heating, everything becomes a very important strategic task. But, uh, you know, there are quite a number of uh, areas where we can learn from Russia, if not all of Russia, then parts of Russia. Look, for example, at uh, at least a couple of uh, regions which I visited when I was ambassador there. Belgorod, the best possible agricultural success in 10, 15 years. Amazing. The quality of roads, it's as if you are entering another country when you pass through the boundaries of this particular region of Russia. The fact of the matter that the government, the governor was born in, uh, in the village of Pakrovka, where I have my own roots, maybe helps explain it how it happened. I think so. But no, really, the government himself would not have been able to do so if he hadn't found an opportunities provided by Russian legislation and uh, the ability to interact in a manner that creates these opportunities. There is another one, there is uh, Kaluga region, which has uh, attracted so much investment that they need to import labor force from everywhere because they simply cannot really cover the need for all the international companies who came here. Shouldn't we take these examples as something which is useful to our own experience? I think that we should. We should look into it. Maybe not everything can be done in parallel with that. But these are good examples. And uh, we can also learn from certain areas inside Ukraine itself where the disparities between regional, you know, ability to work more efficiently is also quite evident. I do not believe that it is useful to limit our uh, views or not to draw from useful experience wherever it is uh, been a success. Thank you. But with apologies to those who wanted to ask a question, I'm afraid we are out of time. I would ask you all, please, to remain in your seats while the Minister and his delegation leave. Uh, but now I'd like to thank you, ask you to join me in thanking the Minister for coming here. Thank you.